want to talk to you today and kind of just prepare our hearts, and I called it the difference. Um, in other words, what, what's the difference? What difference does it make about this whole resurrection thing? And we understand that, you know, Jesus is our Savior and He's paved the way, but I, I kind of want to just take some time and talk, kind of set the stage, talk a little bit today as we celebrate Palm Sunday. We get ready next week, Easter, to celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus as our, our Lord and Savior. And so what difference, the question is, does the resurrection make? Now, I know that most of us know uh, the difference. You know, we, we are intellectually, knowledgeably, we're aware, we know. But my question isn't, what difference does it make? Like, I'm asking you to answer it. The, think of it this way. What difference is it making in your life and fleshing out in your hands and your feet? What difference is it making in your life? To know it is one thing here. But to know it, one thing here is, is completely different. And so I want to take some time and just talk about that. Maybe you're here today and, and as we go through the message, you're going to find that, you know, you love Jesus, that isn't the issue. But the question is, is, is it making a difference in your life? I'll, I'll share what I mean by that. Uh, we're going to be looking today in, in our Bibles in Matthew chapter 26, and primarily I'll be hanging around there. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. If you've got the uh, smart devices, which pretty much everyone uses now, if you use the U version, uh, we've got the outline there for you. We've got all the fill in the blanks and all that. Um, but we're going to look at Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to look at some other passages as well. So I will be jumping around, but I'll kind of keep coming back to Matthew 26. And I want us to go on a journey today, if you will, and just talk about the difference that this makes and, and help you and myself, help us understand um, the difference that's being made. Because sometimes when God speaks to us, we don't always listen the first time. It reminded me when two dads were driving down the road in a car and two dads are in the front and they have their boys in the back. And the boys were being rowdy, and the boys were not listening. Parents, can you relate to that? <laughs> uh, boys being boys, and one of them unbuckled his seatbelt and started horsing around. And the dad said to him, Johnny, I need you to sit down and buckle up. Uh, but Johnny did not listen. About a minute later, the dad looked back once again and said, Johnny, I really need you to listen to me, and I need you to sit down. But Johnny did not comply. So the third time... Dad looked back and he said, Johnny, I need you to know that when we get home, you're going to get a spanking because you're not listening to me. Johnny's legs turned to jello and he sat down and he looked at his dad and he said, Dad, I want to sit down now. <laughs> and I thought to myself, many times we're like Johnny, you know? My question is why? Why do we wait when God speaks to us? Why is it when God says to do something, we say, we, we may, whether we acknowledge or not, it, we don't comply. And then he has to say it again. And then he has to say it again. You see, in this story, the first time the dad told him to sit down, the boy thought his dad was serious. But the third time, he knew his dad was serious, right? Because of the consequences that were dealt. So, my question this morning when I say what makes the difference, what difference does the resurrection make? Well, here's the difference. There are people in this world that think that Jesus is the Messiah. But because of the resurrection, we know that he's the Messiah. Amen? That's what makes all the difference in the world. There's a lot of people that think they know God or, 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 or have this knowledge base, but, but what they don't understand is this personal relationship of walking with Jesus, that he is the Messiah. And it makes a difference when you know, not just think, when you know. It makes a difference in, in, your, in your behavior. It makes a difference in your character. It makes a difference in how you flesh things out and how you live for the Lord because we know him. So what I want to do today is kind of go on a, on a journey, if you will, through the life of one of the disciples. Um, what this particular disciple loved Jesus. Uh, he thought Jesus was the Messiah, but then he came to a place of not just thinking he was the Messiah, but knowing he's the Messiah. And so 
I, I've only got three points in the outline. The first two are going to go pretty quick. I'm not trying to downplay them at all, but I want to get to the third point and spend some time there because as we are looking on a, on a Palm Sunday and Jesus, his triumphal entry, and, and then we see him go to the cross and we, we see him die and he's risen again. Well, what's the difference? We know that he's the resurrected Lord, but there's a lot of people that, that don't. They just think they know. And this particular disciple thought Jesus was the Messiah. He went from a thinking to a knowing. And so, as I said, I'll go through the first two pretty quick. But in Matthew chapter 26, even before I get to the first point, even before we get to Matthew 26, actually, let me, I, want, I want to read a different portion of Scripture that just sets the stage because we're talking about uh, Peter in the Bible. And Peter in the Bible, is we'll find out in a moment, was a fisherman who was on a boat and had an experience with Jesus. And because of that experience, he became a disciple. He left the boat, followed Jesus, because he thought Jesus was the Messiah. But things didn't go the way that Peter expected them to, and therefore he went back to fishing, and Jesus showed up one more time, as we'll find out in a moment. And, and, and things changed. Because there was something different that second time around when Jesus appeared the second time while Peter was out fishing. In the book of Luke, it says when the first, this is the first time he's out fishing, it says when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, master, we've toiled all night. We've took nothing in, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. I'm going to be reading today from the ESV translation. I just like how it worded it. So I, I, I chose that one. But here's some seasoned fishermen. I want you to remember this. The, these are the deadliest catch guys, right? They're out there. They, they, they can handle all of the machinery, the equipment. They know the ocean. The, they, they, they understand the fishing. They've been fishing all night, all night long. And they've caught absolutely nothing. So remember that. There's nothing there. And nonetheless... Jesus shows up and says, cast, cast your net over there. And they said, we haven't been catching anything. But nonetheless, at your word, I will let the nets down. And they did this. And when they did this, they caught a great number of fish. So many fish that it says that the nets were breaking, right? So you remember this story. So they had a, a great catch. And this is where it, we begin the whole journey with Simon Peter, where Jesus calls him and he says to him, I will make you fishers of men. So Peter and Andrew and James and John, they leave their nets, the Bible says. And when the Bible says that they left their nets, it means that they left their occupation. They had been some hardcore fishermen uh, up to that point in time in their life. Now they are leaving their, laying down their nets. They're laying down their occupation. In, in other words, they're leaving their old life behind. Um, they begin to follow Jesus. And this leads me to Peter's first point. It happened three years after following Jesus. So number one, write down this word, declaration. Peter made a declaration. It's a scripture we're familiar with, but in Matthew 26, it tells us that Peter made a declaration. And I want you to know how Peter, I want you to notice how Peter does it. It says, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered him and said, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Declaration right there. But Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you, makes another declaration. And the disciples did the same. Now, this is not a message today to put Peter down, okay? When we read Peter, we, we understand Peter was a, a great man of God, as we'll see in a moment, the things he did for the church. But when we talk in this context, when we're talking about this particular story, it's easy to put Peter down. But that's not what we're attempting to do. This is not a message to put Peter down. It's not a message to make fun of Peter. It's actually a message to relate 
to Peter. Because I think all of us can relate to Peter. I think we can all, to some degree, to kind of help us understand how we can all relate to him. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever prayed this prayer or have you ever said these words, or may I say it this way, made this declaration? God, if you will get me out of this, I promise I will. And then you fill in the blank. Anyone bold enough to say, yeah, that was me? Because here's the reality. We've probably all prayed that prayer. So if that was you and your hand was raised, the, the second question that I have after that is, is if you said, that was me, because I'm raising my hand because I did it. Lord, if you will get me out of this mess, I promise I'll go feed the children in Zimbabwe or something. You know, you said some crazy thing. You know, I'll, I'll do your work. I'll do whatever you want. I'll go wherever you lead me. And then the thing you said that, get me out of that. And Jesus, by his grace, got you out of that. And then you went and did it again. Have you ever been there? I think we all can probably raise our hand, in all honesty. Jesus, if you'll just get me out of this, I promise I'll never do it again. And no more are we over here saved by grace that we get back over and make that same wrong decision once again. You see, this is exactly what happens. So um, what's my point in sharing all of that? You see, we can relate to Peter. It's not just Peter made, he made such a poor choice or a dumb decision. We've all made poor choices. We've all made dumb decisions. But that's not the focus of what's going on here. You see, we're not here to, to live some kind of a self-righteous life or like a group of self-righteous people saying, well, we'd never do that. I mean, look at Peter. What, what was he thinking? You know, if I were Peter and I were in that situation, you'd what? No, nobody really knows what they would do in that situation. Nobody really knows. So why don't you just look at your own situation and say, what should I do in this situation? Peter had his moment. Maybe today's yours. What's going to make the difference in your life? Peter made a declaration, and he meant it because he thought Jesus was the Messiah. And this is just, this is, he was limited, but this is just where his thinking was. I thought he was going to come. I thought he was going to rule the world and govern everything, and we were all going to, you know, be victorious. And, and, and we are, and Jesus did do that, just not the way Peter expected. He thought one way. And so he started making some declarations, even if others fall away. I, I won't, I, I got your back, Jack. Even if I have to die, I will die for you. And then all of a sudden, things took a turn. So this is the number one thing. He made a declaration, just like we've all done. We've made declarations only to stumble back into the thing we declared we wouldn't do again. That's what Peter did. Which led to number two, write down the denial. The denial. He made a declaration which led to the denial. Now, let me read this to you. It's from Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. It says that Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you mean. Strike one. <laughs> and when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystander, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. Strike two. He said, I don't know this man. And after a little while, a bystander came up and said to Peter, certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and swear. I don't know the man. Strike three. It says immediately, before he finished even saying the third, uh, the, the third denial, a rooster started to crow. And he went out, it says, and wept bitterly. You see, he went out and he didn't just tear up and say, oh, oops, I did it again. He didn't just say, man, I, I messed up. He wept bitterly because he, he truly believed what he believed and yet here he was again making declarations and then falling into it. You see, an example of an oath when it says that, that he, um, he made an oath, it would be like what we do when we put our hand on a stack of Bibles and we say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. You know, you make that oath. Now, he wasn't saying those words, but he was saying basically that, you know, I, 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 I don't know this guy. And, and not only did he go so far as to say, I don't know this guy, he went and identified with the past once again and started to cuss. It says, it says that he swore, not swear like in, you know, like he's Swear, you're swearing in an officer or something. It means he was saying, you blankety, 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 blankety. He started cussing and identifying with 
who he once was, who he used to be. And in verse 73, it says he began to invoke a curse on himself and, and swear. So this isn't the oath type of swearing. It's the bad kind of swearing that used to get me in trouble. And he says, I don't know the man. Now, watch, watch this. It says that when Peter did this, it says immediately a rooster crowed. Can you imagine being Peter in that moment? Think about that for a moment. Try to, try to place yourself there. You've watched Jesus do these miracles and he's called you to follow him and you do. And you tell him, I got your back. I'll follow you wherever you lead. I'll follow whatever you feed. I'll swallow. And then all of a sudden, the, the declarations. I don't know who you are. I don't know who this man is because things started to get difficult. Things started to get tough. And all of a sudden, when Jesus told you, by the time you have denied me three times, a rooster would crow. Peter hears that rooster crowing. Imagine how bad Peter must have felt in that moment. Uh, he said to Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'll never deny you. But Jesus said, no, you're going to three times. No, Lord, even if I have to die with you. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the rooster's crowing. And while he's denying him the third time, he hears that sound. But let me show you some, some other scripture about this denial. In Luke chapter 22, verse 60, it says, Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter, it says. So not only did he deny the Lord, and not only is he hearing the rooster crowing, but now the Lord is turning, Jesus is turning and looking at him. Imagine how Peter must have felt. You see, what you have to understand is, is they were in a courtyard. Courtyards weren't very big. It, I, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when I read and I study, they say that typically a courtyard was going to be something like 30 yards by 30 yards. So it's a, roughly you know, 100 feet. And, and I stepped it off and it's roughly from that doorway to that doorway. We'll have an usher that stands there at each doorway handing out bulletins before church, right? And, and if you were to stand over there and look over that direction, you'd be able to see them. You'd be able to recognize them. You'd be able to, 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 to see their face. And, and so he was there somewhere in the vicinity of the courtyard. And when Peter denies him and the rooster crows, he's just a few yards away. And Jesus looks. How bad would you feel? if you were Peter. But I think it gets even worse than that. Because what some of us might not remember is that what was happening to Jesus at that time is he was being physically beaten. He wasn't just standing before a board. He wasn't just standing before a council. He wasn't just standing before religious leaders. He was being physically assaulted. He was being uh, he was being beat up and taking punches. You read a few verses in the Scriptures. It tells us in Mark 15 that they clothed him in purple cloaks. So let the mocking begin. They start making fun of him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on him. And they began to salute him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. They were making fun of him. They were disrespecting him. They were mocking everything that he stood for. Luke twenty two sixty four 64 says they also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who struck you? So Jesus is getting punched in the face. He's taken blow after blow and they're laughing about it and making fun of it. And Peter's observing all of this that's going on. I ask you again, if you were Peter, how, how, how do you think you'd feel uh, being in that position? Mark says that they plucked out his beard out of his face. Now, I don't grow much facial hair, Okay. You know, the little I got, I just trimmed to make it look good, but it doesn't get full and bushy. But when I do get a little bit and I don't shave, I've got this cute little granddaughter. And when she gets a handful of anything, flesh, hair, she doesn't let go. I picked her up the other day and I was like, hey, sweetheart, how you doing, baby? Ow, 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 ow. She almost had me to my knees. I was like, God, let go, let go, let go, let go. I mean, she needed a nail trimming, that was for sure. But she got just behind the back of my ear, right? She got a little bit of my hair and she just pulled on that and grinned while she did it. It's almost like she enjoyed torturing me, right? She's like, that's right, get down on your knees, you know. I, that, that pain was horrible. But here, 
I, 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 that, that, that obviously doesn't even compare to the fact they're ripping Jesus' beard out of his flesh. And what you have to remember is, it's at that point when he turned and looked at Peter and looked at him with most likely a couple black eyes, most likely a, a broken nose, a bloody nose. Most, most likely his lips were split and bleeding and blood running down his cheek and down his face from the thorn that was placed upon his head. Now, how bad would you feel? And remember, we're not putting Peter down, okay? We're not putting Peter down. We're relating to Peter. Some of you might say, well, I, I never denied Jesus with my words. Okay, have you denied him with your works? Because Titus tells us in Titus 1.16, they, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. In other words, they, they believe in God, but they, they want to keep some distance. They don't want to completely and fully associate. Now, now, I know this is a very serious moment, but just think about it. We've all done this. We've all been here. We've made a declaration. And then we've denied the Lord. We've just, we just, I'm just settling it. We've all had some point where we've done this, where we've messed up. We've made that declaration. I'll never do it again. And then we end up doing it again. Can you imagine? I, I'll speak for myself but you feel free to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. On the times when there's something I've done that I've got myself jammed up, I'm in a mess, I'm embarrassed, I'm feeling this guilt and this shame, and I say, Jesus, if you would just get me out of this, and then by His grace, He comes and He delivers me out of that, and I say, I'll never do that again. And then I do the very thing I said I wouldn't do, and I do it again. And there's even more of that sh shame that's there. And there's that guilt that weighs so heavy. And I'm sure not going to talk to anybody else about it because the shame is so great. I don't even want to look in the mirror. I'm not going to talk to anybody else. And yet Jesus knows the depth of your shame and your guilt. And He says, it's by My grace. He says, I'll come and I'll pick you up. You see, Peter's in that moment where he feels like he can't get any lower than he's already gotten. So we can relate to Peter. Peter became one of the greatest voices, though, in the New Testament, right? He became one of the greatest voices. He's called the pillar of the church. So what changed? Well, this is where number three comes in. Write down the decision. This is where we turn the corner and you start saying, Pastor, everything, I'm feeling... You know, is there any hope? Yeah, absolutely. It all comes right here with the decision. The, the decision happens, though, for Peter. He understands the decision happens after the resurrection. Not when he thinks that Jesus is the Messiah, when he knows that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what makes all the difference in the world. Peter thought Jesus was the Messiah. But he didn't understand that Jesus came to die so that he could be resurrected and that there would be something beyond the cross. All he saw was what he saw. And sometimes that's our limits too. Sometimes all we see is what we see, but God sees the bigger picture. Amen? He can see everything that is going on. And so he was still discouraged. He was still upset because he denied Jesus. And he makes this statement. And remember, Peter met Jesus the first time fishing all night, right? And Jesus said, cast down your nets on the side of the boat. And he said, we've been fishing all night, but at your word, we will do it. And then he left and followed Jesus. Well, when Jesus was crucified, Peter said, I'm going back. He said, I'm going back to what I knew. Have you ever, maybe you can identify with that. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, but there's a difference between when God's leading you in a new, in a new direction versus going back to the old you, you know? And he says, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to do the thing I know how to do, the thing I can maybe control. Maybe the thing that I, I know that I can just be familiar with. And he's out fishing. And it says in John chapter 21, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and they got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. They didn't know he had been resurrected yet. They didn't know, they, they didn't know that he was, he was there on the side. 
And uh, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said to him, he said, cast the nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it in and now they, were, uh, they weren't able to haul it in because the quantity of fish. Uh, the, disciples whom, whom Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said, Peter, it's the Lord. A light bulb went off for him. He said, I'm having a moment of deja vu. I, th- th- this, ha- th- this happened before. This is Jesus. It's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. And when they got on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. I, I, I can only imagine what must have been going on with, with Peter. You know, all the, de- the de- denial and, and then Jesus gets crucified and all of a sudden he makes his appearance to him. And what's the first thing he does? Jumps out of the boat into the water, swimming towards him. You see, most people, when they do something and they feel like they're stuck because of shame and guilt, and they know that somebody enters the room, they want to go hide. They want to go the other direction. But now Simon Peter... Because he learned something. What, was it, what made the difference for him? He now understood the resurrection. Did he experience that guilt and that shame? Sure, he did at one point, but he had, a, he had a lesson to learn. In John chapter 21, verse 18, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, this is Jesus, he's speaking to them. When you were young, you used to dress yourselves and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now, if you keep reading uh, John, uh, if you keep reading John um, said to Peter, that's Jesus over there. And they were only about 100 100 yards off. So, you know, you you could see, but Peter, he jumps in and swims towards Jesus. He goes his direction. And when he gets there, this is the cool thing that I, I really liked. He swims, he gets on the shore. And what does he find when he gets on the shore? Jesus with the fire already going, fish cooking on the grill, bread's already done. What, what's the simple point of all of that? No matter where you've been, no matter, no, no matter what you do, as long as you swim his direction, God's your provider. He has everything ready for you, everything that you need, no matter how far you think you've gotten away from God. God will always provide when we come into his presence. When we come into his presence. So I asked myself this question. If, if Peter was fishing on the boat and the whole net thing, you know, and then the resurrection, and then he's meeting Peter again and he's doing the whole boat thing again with the fish. Why, why is he doing that miracle again? And I, th- this is just my own opinion, but my thoughts are simply this. I think the only reason he did it was was to say to Peter, listen to me, Peter, it's okay. It's okay. You can start again, Peter. We're going to go back to where where I once was, where we once met. And this time, it's not about what you think. This time, it's about what you know. See, you can start over. He may say, I know you messed up. I know what you did. I saw you do it. I heard you say it. But listen, he said, I died for your failures. I rose again so that you can start again. And every time you make a mistake, Peter, uh, why why, why else would would he do this? And then he goes into this famous passage where he talks to Peter and three times, do you remember he asked Peter, do you love me? Do you remember that? He said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? You know all things, right? You know I love you. Why would he ask him to do that? You know, I, I, I can't help but make a connection of the three times that he denied Jesus and then the three times that Jesus said, do you love me? Almost as if he had to make sure that, you know, did, did God really need to know? No, I think Peter needed to know. Peter needed to know that he knew that God loved him so much You see, maybe you're here today and you're the one that's having doubts right now. He spoke that to Peter. He said, Peter, I I know you've had your doubts. I know you felt bad because you messed up, but you need to know something. The resurrection takes care of all of that. It takes care of your failures. 
And then he makes a, a statement to Peter. He does this, he does this miracle, this uh, fish in, in Luke chapter 5. And from that point on, he sa- it says again, Peter left his nets to follow him. Um, Peter says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you. Uh, Jesus asked you and me the same question today. Two words that are all important. Follow me. When you feel like you're distant from the Lord, all he wants to know is this. Are you going to follow me? When you feel like you're full of shame and guilt, do you know that you can come to a Savior and all he's going to say is, follow me. You can feel like you're broken and like, like nothing's ever going to be right. And he'll say, follow me because the resurrection takes care of Of all of that, I believe that he went back and did that same miracle just to show him you can start once again, but it starts with making a recommitment right here and now. Follow me, he says. Follow me all the way to the cross. Peter had heard that message many times before, and you read it many times, by the way, in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus said it more than once, but here's just one of them. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and what? follow me. So he's always told them, he's always told his disciples, if you're going to follow me, it's going to be to a cross. So what's the difference though? Well, the difference is that Peter knew that the cross meant death. He knew that the cross meant death. But what he didn't know until that moment was that it meant life after death. See, when he looked at the cross, all he saw was death. But when Jesus looked at the cross, all he saw was eternal life. Now Peter has learned something new. Peter thought he was the Messiah. Now Peter knows he is the Messiah. So Peter starts to follow him again. Luke Luke chapter 5, he started to follow him. But in John chapter 21, he makes a commitment to follow him once again. And that commitment makes the difference because we know that he became a great leader in the church. We know that Peter made some great uh, accomplishments, but what's the difference? Well, back in Matthew 26, Peter said, I'll never deny you, but he followed at a distance. That's what happened in Matthew 26. But in John 21, Jesus says, follow me, not just to the cross, but through the cross into everlasting life. Matthew chapter 26, verse 58 says, Peter was following at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. So I've got a question for you today, and that question is this. It's a serious question. Let me do it this way. Are you following Jesus? Are you following Jesus? Here's a follow-up, a few follow-ups. Are Are you following him at a distance? Or maybe I should ask, how closely are you following him? Are you you following him at at all? And are you following him all the way to the cross so that you can get through that? Because Jesus shows up in John 21 and he says to him, Peter, you want to follow me? Let let me tell you where it's going to end for you. You're going to follow me all the way to the cross. And we know uh, because of history that Peter was crucified, right? Right? but he was crucified upside down. Because when they, told him, <clears throat> when they told him that they were going to crucify him, he said, please crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to die in a manner that my Lord died. Here's a man whose life was totally changed from denying Jesus to preaching Jesus to the whole world. Everything changed. You see, Peter, once that changed for him, Then all of a sudden in the book of Acts chapter 1 is where we, uh, right at the beginning, we get the introduction of the Holy Spirit, right? And and Peter starts to preach. Acts chapter 2.15 says that Peter started to preach with this phenomenal power, not because he knew the Messiah, but because he thought he knew, but because he knew him here relationally. And he said, for those people are not drunk, he said to those people, as others suppose. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, that in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit, On all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Peter said in Acts chapter 3 6, I have no silver, I have no gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. It was in chapter 4 of Acts that Peter 
um, when they beat him for preaching the word of God, it's Peter that says, nor is there salvation in for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereas uh, men might be saved. It was in Acts chapter 5. It's Peter. When it talks about that they brought people to sit down in beds or couches or whatever they had back then, just in hopes that the shadow of Peter would, would cross them so that they, they might be healed just being in his presence. What made the difference from Peter being somebody who made a declaration, but oops, he did it again and got into denial. What made all the difference in the world was the decision that he made. It's the resurrection that changes our lives. That's what makes all the difference. The resurrection made the difference. Our God conquered death, hell, and the grave. That's what made the difference. The difference was that in Luke chapter 5, Peter thought, um, but in John 21, he knew. And when Jesus said, follow me to the cross, he said, yeah, I'll follow you to the cross because I know now that you live after the cross. I made a commitment when I was 14 years old um, to follow Jesus. But I followed him at a distance. I got involved in all sorts of wrong and bad stuff, which is a whole other sermon. But when I was 23 years old, driving on Highway 61 in a Toyota Starlet, I moved from thinking to knowing because of the resurrection. I was literally driving down the highway, reevaluating my life. I knew God here. But it wasn't happening here. I was following God, but I was following Him at a distance. And something had to change. And the difference for me personally was not just that it was understanding about the resurrection, but it was about all the guilt and the shame that I was carrying in my life, all of that baggage. And I didn't know what to do with it. Well, you were a pastor's kid. You grew up in church. That doesn't mean that you know everything. And when you're carrying all that, Jesus just simply wants to know, will you follow me? Will you follow me? Wherever I go, will you follow me there? You see, this is going to come as a shock, but I made some mistakes in my life. I know that really surprises you. But God, by his grace, comes and delivers and saves. I had to go back to him and, and say, Lord, you know all things. You know that even though I did this, I, I really love you. And Jesus would always say to me, follow me. Lord, I'm sorry for the things I've done. And when I repent, he says, follow me. Lord, what if I mess up again? All he says is, follow me. Just keep following me. And that's what I'm asking every one of you today, no matter where you're at in your heart. Are you here today and Maybe you're following Jesus, but it's at a distance. Or maybe you're here today and you haven't been following him at all. And it's a decision you need to make today. It's easy to read about somebody else who struggled with it. It's another thing to be that person. You don't need to leave here today and wonder, what should I do? You can make that decision today. Maybe, maybe it's guilt and shame from decisions you've already made that you've been carrying around that weigh so heavy. Pastor, I want to I wanna celebrate the resurrection, but it's like this guilt and this shame is like a boat anchor that just weighs me down. Wouldn't you like to be free of that? And we would cry, yes! Then you can make a choice today to follow Him. I want to ask if you just close your eyes with me as we get ready to close. And I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you're here today and you have not been following Jesus and you feel the Lord tugging on your heart. Make that decision today. Maybe you've been following. You love Jesus. It's not a question about your love for him, but you've been following at a distance. And he's asking you today to follow him. Maybe you're watching online right now and you're sitting in your home and he's tugging at your heart. He's speaking to you. You got a decision to make. Follow me, he says. Maybe you're here today and you've made some of those decisions that, oh man, they just feel like they're boat anchors, this, this weight of guilt. 
and shame. And I, I want to be free of that today. If you're here today, I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. You're saying, Pastor, that's me. I want to, I want to make that, dis, that, that decision today. Maybe you're watching online or you're sitting and watching. Raise your hand. If that's you. Just simply raise your hand. I want to agree in prayer with you that today can be the day that you not just think you know, but you know you know. Father, you see those that have their hands lifted. You know what weight they're carrying. You know the baggage that comes with it. And Lord, you understand guilt and shame any better than us because it's by your grace that comes in and saves us and delivers us. So Lord, we choose today to make a decision to follow you. And as we follow you, Jesus, Lord, we know we're following to a cross, but we know today also we're following through it into the promise of eternity that you have for each and every one of us. So Father, we receive that today and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in this morning. We hope that you'll join us again next week or better yet, join us in person. We are located at 816 13th Avenue North in Clinton, Iowa. Our Sunday morning worship service is at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. If you have any questions about our church or what it means to follow Christ, check us out online at cotod.church. That's C-O-T-O-D dot church. We look forward to hearing from you soon.